Um, welcome to the Miami Group Sierra Club Monthly Educational Forum. Um, the Miami Group of the Sierra Club has these educational forums once a month. Um, this month is here in Loveland. It's usually at the headquarters at um, Mount Arbor and Presbyterian Church, but we're here today because this uh, presentation is going to cover some stuff that are <laughs> that are specific to Loveland. Um, and I also thank the Loveland library for hosting us. Um, so tonight's talk is going to be about um, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, also known as PFAS or PFAS, sometimes called forever chemicals. And these chemicals have made their way into our drinking water. So my name is Lauren Enda and I'm a member of the Sierra Club and also a former resident of Loveland. I first learned about the negative health outcomes of PFAS, especially on young women, at one of the Sierra Club's educational forums a few years ago. Since then, I've been concerned about the safety of our drinking water, eventually purchasing a carbon filter for my own home. So a few housekeeping notes. The bathrooms are located just if you go straight out there. Um, oh, are there some back there? Okay, thank you. And if you haven't already done so, please silence your phone. So we're going to have two, presenta two presentations tonight, and we ask that you hold all questions until both have spoken. For those participants on Zoom, you, um, we will monitor the chat, and you can put your questions in the chat room. So tonight presentation, tonight's presentations will be recorded and available on the Miami Group website at miamigroup.org. And Loveland Magazine is also here, and they'll be recording as well, and we'll be posting it. Um, to their website at um, lovelandmagazine.com or on Facebook at Loveland Magazine. And we always thank Loveland Magazine for supporting local initiatives. So we have some handouts for you that will be available at the end of the program. And if you'd like for us to contact you later with any updates or new news, you know, please make sure you sign in with your email at the back. Okay, now I'm gonna just briefly introduce our speakers. The first one is going to be Nathan Alley. He's an employee of the Sierra Club Ohio chapter, and he's going to talk about the history of PFAS, the negative outcomes from PFAS, and the new legally enforceable standards from the federal government to ensure our drinking water is safe. Sharon Scovanner, a resident of Loveland and a concerned citizen, will discuss Loveland's PFAS levels specifically and examine how the city of Loveland has responded to this crisis. Sharon has done hundreds of hours of research, phone calls, interviews, and public outreach about the PFAS crisis and wants to share the information with as many people as possible. Her husband, Tom, a retired criminal prosecutor, will deliver part of that presentation. And now we'll start with Nathan. All right, hello everybody. Hello online, hello here in person. We've got about 50 people in the room, if I can count well, which I can't, and we've got a great crowd online too. So folks online, we're gonna do our best to accommodate everybody, and we will definitely make our materials available for folks who aren't able to be here tonight. Um, I'm gonna be cycling through these slides. I'm gonna give you a real quick agenda. So as Lauren mentioned, why are we here tonight? Let me close out that chat. Um, we are here to learn about forever chemicals, what they are, why you should be interested in them, what people are doing about them, what you can do about them, and we're gonna hear some specific perspectives from our organization, the Sierra Club, and then also from uh, some folks who live here in the area and have become concerned and knowledgeable <coughs> about this issue and wanna share their findings with you all. Uh, my name is Nathan Alley, I work for the Ohio chapter of the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is, as you might know, a large national organization with its headquarters in California, but we have chapters in almost all the states, and the Ohio chapter spans our entire state of Ohio here. Um, we work on a number of issues that are germane to folks all around the state and nationally. I myself live here, uh, I'm a proud graduate of Indian Hill, live in the house that I grew up in, we bought it from my dad not too long ago, um, and so I definitely live in what I would consider this community, and I'm affected by the same issues that we're gonna be talking about tonight. But even though we're here in Loveland, and even though I'm gonna be talking about things pertaining to your community and other communities in Ohio, this is an issue that is really common to all of us in Ohio and all of us nationally, unfortunately. 
So this is a universal thing that we're going to learn about tonight. Um, really quickly, uh, I hope, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Sierra Club and what we do in addition to the PFAS work. Um, I wanted to highlight one thing. So we, uh, we have a, a set of priorities that we've established for our statewide work in Ohio. There are five of them that touch on various issue areas. And in our water-related category, Forever Chemicals, PFAS, PFOS, this was our number one issue that I was identified by our volunteers and members as their concern for the state of Ohio. So this is the second in a series of presentations that we'll be doing about the issue and trying to educate people from around the state. Okay, so I was going to talk to you just really briefly about a bill that's working its way through the Ohio legislature. It's House Bill 197. It would authorize what we call community solar projects in the state of Ohio. So right now, if you want to put solar on your roof, that's great. Go out and do it if you are capable of doing that. However, if you and your neighbor want to share the cost of a solar project and then share in that renewable energy, in Ohio you cannot do that. Uh, I have too many trees in my yard. I cannot actually put solar on my roof. The neighbor's in the opposite situation, but we cannot make a project together and share in that solar energy. The same thing would be true for a small community or a neighborhood or a multifamily home. So what we're looking for is legislation in Ohio that would authorize that and unlock solar potential for all in Ohio. This is an issue of equity. It's an issue of combating climate change, uh, economics, all of the above. So House Bill 197, we want to vote yes on that in Ohio. Um, and uh, with no further ado, I'm going to get to the PFAS talk. So what is PFAS? Why are we here? Why are you concerned? So forever chemicals, I'm, I'm going to stop using the term PFAS because what we're really talking about here is a large category of so-called forever chemicals. And these were uh, essentially invented back in the early 20th century for a number of industrial uses. Um, things like firefighting foam retardants, uh, heat resistant linings for different materials, um, things that you would put in your clothes to make them waterproof. So really ubiquitous throughout our lives for going on more than 100 years. Um, they're forever chemicals because unfortunately they're so advanced, they're so strong, they're so durable that they don't break down quickly or ever in the environment or if they were to enter living organisms like the human body, um, they don't break down in your body over time and they simply accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And they come from a variety of different sources, both into our environment and into our human bodies. Um, I mentioned a couple of examples already. Uh, one is in firefighting operations, the, the foam, the fire retardant that they use to combat fires, a very important and necessary public service. Um, uses a lot of these chemicals. They've been found to be very successful. But that then causes a lot of uh, indirect effects because that foam doesn't just stay on site, it leaches off. And so, for example, our, um, our local Miami group here, that's the Sierra Club, their territory stretches up above North, Dayton, uh, north above Dayton. And as I understand it, around the Dayton airport, there are training grounds that fire departments use to train for firefighting activities. Again, very necessary activity, um, but the foam that they have used over the decades has essentially left the property and contaminated the surrounding soil and the groundwater and surface waters. And so that's a hot spot up near Dayton. Unfortunately, it's not the only hot spot in the state of Ohio uh, that we're contending with. Um, because not only are they in these firefighting foams, but as I mentioned, they're in all kinds of everyday products that we use and that surround us. That when they go into the landfill, for example, also are a pathway for the chemicals to reach our environment, our waterways, our soil. And then we wear the clothes, we drink out of the water bottles, we eat out of the fast food containers, and all these things are essentially sloughing off every time and entering your bloodstream and just accumulating and accumulating and accumulating over time. So, They've been invented, they've been used all over the place. You encounter them whether you know it or not on a daily basis. What, why is this a problem? Why should you be concerned about this? And the answer is that they have come up with a huge host of health problems that they've tied to these forever chemicals being in your body, including various types of cancer and uh, probably the most significantly reproductive problems um, the PFAS and other forever chemicals are what we call endocrine disruptors, endocrine disruptors, 
when they enter your body or other living organisms, they mess with your hormone system. And in particular, they mess with reproductive hormones and can render people infertile or have other uh, fertility problems or problems with uh, the viability of, of their, their fetuses. And so this is really a problem that you're not going to see right in front of you. You're not going to get sick tonight because you drank out of a water bottle and wake up tomorrow feeling ill. This might be a problem that my children who are in first and second grade are going to encounter in 20 or 30 years when they go to the doctor someday. And so what we're trying to do and the reason we're educating you all and the reason we're concerned about what's going on in Loveland and Milford and Indian Hill and the rest of Ohio is that we're still learning about all of these problems. Now we've known for some time that they are a problem or potentially a problem and so studies have been ongoing for years and significantly one of the reasons we're talking about this right now is that the federal government just a couple of months ago took a very significant action which will change the way we think about, address, and hopefully combat the problem of forever chemicals. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the federal government is doing about the problem, what the state is doing about the problem, and then what local governments are or are not doing about the problem, and then I will turn the mic over to Tom and Sharon. Um, but the federal government has been studying this issue for years, and the federal US EPA finally issued a ruling this last March that puts a limit on PFAS and other forever chemicals, actually a host of six forever chemicals that have been identified as the most problematic. Um, and it's under a, a federal law called the Safe Drinking Water Act. And it puts a limit on these chemicals in our water supplies. Now, up until this year, the federal government had a, a sort of a soft cap of 70 parts per trillion. So I'm gonna use this parts per trillion. It's literally like a drop of a drop of a drop of water in a lake, but the, the accepted threshold of safety up until this year was 70 parts per, tri per trillion. That was not a federal limit, but it was what people considered the safe limit. And when communities like Loveland, Union Hill, Milford, and other places were monitoring, they were keeping that number in the back of their head. So for context, three years ago, let's say your water supply was reading at 35 parts per trillion, under a standard of 70, that seems healthy, right? Well, after years and years and years of study, they adjusted the numbers, and what they have now found is that A, there are no safe levels of forever chemicals in water, in the human body, in nature, but that for the purposes of regulation, they've set the limit at four, four parts per trillion. So imagine, and we're gonna talk about this, but, uh, oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Um, four parts per trillion. So imagine that you are a water provider, okay? And imagine that you're ahead of the curve and you've been monitoring for this thing that no one's even heard about 10 years ago, and you thought you were fine at 35 parts per trillion, and all of a sudden the federal government says, no, you've gotta get down to four or under in order to be safe. What do you do? So that's a huge shock to the system here in America. Now, to be fair, water providers were prepared for this. This is a conversation that's been ongoing for years. And the idea of the four, four, four parts per trillion uh, threshold was set or, or proposed more than a year ago. So no one's shocked by this. However, it is a tremendous undertaking some communities have already spent you know, millions or even billions of dollars to combat this. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit about how the city of Cincinnati has already taken some steps to filter uh, their water, at least at one of their uh, water providing uh, facilities. But regardless, we now um, are in this environment where we know that nothing's safe, but we wanna get things down to four parts per trillion. Sharon and Tom are gonna to tell you a little bit about what our numbers are locally. Spoiler alert, they're above four parts per trillion. They were below 70, so six months ago, but they're, they're above the new standard. The EPA has set two uh, timelines, essentially. So local governments, other water providers, have three years from March to start monitoring and getting a handle on what's in their water. After that three year period, there's an additional two year period, so up to five years, where they have to actually start 
mitigating, uh, essentially curing the water, filtering it, other, other fixes, and getting it out of your system. So five years from now, which is a long time, people will actually have to start doing something about it. Fortunately, we're a bit ahead of the curve here in Ohio and locally in that we have been monitoring. We do know what the levels are. We don't need a three-year period to figure that out. We know that there's a problem now and we need to get on it. And so there's a few things that I'm gonna leave you with as recommendations. Um, I can take questions later and try to fill in some of the gaps from the slides that you didn't see. Before I turn it over to Tom and Sharon, the two recommendations I'm gonna give you are this. Number one, on an individual level, if you are concerned about drinking water that might have these forever chemicals in it, if you are getting your water from Loveland, Indian Hill, Milford, and you know that you are at risk, you can buy an at-home filtration system. Um, I've got in the slide deck, and we'll share the, the slides later as well so you have uh, access to this, thank you. Um, another organization, not Sierra Club, so we, I'm not endorsing this, but the Environmental Working Group is another large, large environmental group that has essentially put together a buyer's guide and they recommend four different at-home filters. You can go, you know, Google Environmental Working Group, you can go to the link that I've got up there. Um, they range in price, they range in efficacy, but there are four that are at least pretty successful. Um, the main difference is going to be how much they cost initially versus how much it costs to replace the filters on an ongoing basis. And so if you're interested in this, just make sure you know that difference. Um, there are cheaper options that you then have to pay a lot more money on over time versus the nicer options, which you might not pay as much over time, but you have to shell out three or 400 bucks initially. So that's what you can do personally. Now, avoiding it, I don't wanna say that it's impossible, but just because we're monitoring for it here doesn't mean other communities are everywhere, at least not yet. And so really anywhere you go, you might be at risk of this. Now, again, it's not gonna make you sick tonight. It's a long-term problem, but if you wanna minimize your exposure, try to drink water that you know where it came from and that you tried to filter yourself or that you know someone else did. That's an individual thing that you can do. The macro thing, the Sierra Club thing, the organizing thing, the advocacy thing, is making sure that your elected officials, your water providers are on top of this, right? So two things could happen following this EPA rule that dropped in March. Everyone can say, oh my goodness, this is a problem, we need to start working on it now, or as is likely to happen, Somewhere out there will say, that's a bad idea, we're gonna sue, we're gonna try to delay this, we're gonna try to stop it. There may be communities in Ohio, unfortunately, that, that are on that train. Make sure it's not your community. Make sure you're not holding it up. Make sure we're not keeping the people who are trying to keep us safe from doing their job. On top of that, I already mentioned, we know a lot about what's going on with our water locally. We know where the problems are. We know that things need to be done to fix it. So don't let people wait two, three, four, or five years. Act now. And to that end, I, one thing I didn't mention that I'll just mention in closing here, um, there is money that is and will be available from the federal government more for water providers than for individuals at this point. But it's not as though the EPA dropped this rule and said, okay, now you guys figure this out. Um, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act of a few years ago, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, and then even further legislation that, that is pending, all provides you know, billions of dollars for water systems around the country to make these changes, to install this filtration. Um, it's just a matter of people applying for the money and, uh, and making it happen. Um, one other thing, I, I keep saying I'm gonna close out. I, I remembered one more thing that I did wanna mention and then Sharon and Tom, I'm gonna turn it over to you and we're gonna try to get their slide deck up here, fun times. Um, I mentioned that the primary rule that we've been talking about with the drinking water, that's under the Safe Drinking Water Act. It was not reported as much because I think it was confusing to people, but almost a week after that happened, another federal rule dropped under the Comprehensive, I'm not even gonna do it, it's CERCLA, it's the acronym. Um, it's the Hazardous Waste Law. And so what this does is it's going, to re it's going to basically make the people that are creating these chemicals responsible for the legacy of them and cleaning them up and being financially responsible for cleanup and for the health effects, et cetera. 
the, the Superfund law is what this is, if you remember Superfund. Um, we've unfortunately had some experience with that in this region. So I'm gonna stop talking, but if you've got a billion questions for me, I'll take them at the end. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to the Scovaners. Scovaners? Scovaners? You always gotta do that, right? Um, I'm gonna hand you the microphone. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start while she works on my slides, because I have a few things I'd like to say before we get to them. Um, I would also like to thank um, the Sierra Club for bringing this month's education forum to Loveland. A special thanks to Nathan and the members of the Miami group for putting this event together. Thank you so much for doing this. Again, my name is Sharon Scovanner. I've been a Loveland resident for 13 years. Um, in November of 2023, I read an article on Cincinnati.com about Loveland's drinking water having some of the highest levels of PFAS in the area. I wasn't really educated about PFAS at the time, but I knew enough to be concerned and I wanted to learn more. You see, my dad was exposed to toxic drinking water while serving in the Marines at Camp Lejeune. Later in life, he developed a type of cancer due to this exposure that the VA determined was linked to his death. Because of this, exposure to toxic drinking water is a personal issue for me. I feel a moral obligation to make sure that what happened to my dad doesn't happen to anybody else. Everyone deserves to have clean, safe drinking water, no matter their income level, where they live, or where their water comes from. Tonight, I'd like to share some of what I've learned over the last six months. I'm not a scientist, a chemist, a lawyer, or a journalist. I'm just like you, a concerned resident who wants to protect my family, my friends, and my neighbors from the negative health effects of forever chemicals in our drinking water. Most of the information that I'm sharing tonight was taken from publicly available sources. Some was obtained through public records request. <clears throat> this, this notebook contains all the cor corresponding documents to the footnoted things that you'll see in our presentation tonight. It will be available for viewing after tonight's presentation if you would like to look at it. The first thing I'd like to do is start by sharing the test results. To simplify things, we're going to be comparing test results just for PFOS. And it's one of the chemicals that Nathan was talking about. And the reason we're going to be looking at that and that alone is because that's the chemical that's in Loveland's drinking water in excess of the four parts per trillion. So if you look at the chart, what you'll see is test results starting in 2020. And the reason 2020 is important is because that's when Ohio EPA first started testing all the public water systems. So in Ohio, at least we know what the levels are because every public water system was tested in 2020. So in 2020, you can see that Loveland's test results range from 14.8 to 24. And the reason there's a range there is because any water system that detected um, any kind of PFAS, whichever one of the six, they were required to do quarterly testing. So Loveland had to have testing done every quarter because we found it initially. So that's why there's a range. Indian Hill and Milford are listed because those two communities draw from the same aquifer that Loveland does. We get our water in Loveland from the ground and it's wells, and this aquifer also serves the community of Indian Hill and Milford. Um, so if you continue on in 2021 and 2022 and 2023, you'll see that Loveland's numbers range from 14, the low in 2021, up until numbers that were um, published from 2023 in June or July, I believe, and we saw the highest number in 2023 of 35. 
one of the wells in Loveland tested 35. And if you remember from what Nathan said, the number we're looking for is four or less. So that's quite high. Um, Indian Hill and Milford have PFOS, the same PFOS in their water, but not at the same levels as Loveland. And I guess everybody might want to say, why is that? That's the million dollar question, right? Maybe Nathan will have an idea about that, I don't know. Um, that's certainly not my expertise, but it is what it is. Milford's numbers, they only recorded numbers in 2020. Um, I checked their um, documents and they did not report any numbers for 21, 22, or 23, and that's why those lines are blank. Another mention that Nathan had was Cincinnati. Obviously, Cincinnati um, provides water to a lot of communities, and it's a huge water system. So they have two plants. One is called Bolton, and one is called Miller. And the Miller plant serves 88% of their customers. And fortunately, that plant already um, uses carbon filtration, and so their plant is already good. They're already testing below four. So that ND stands for non-detectable. So anybody who gets their water from Cincinnati, from that plant, is good. The other plant, which is called um, Bolton, um, does not filter currently at all. So their levels are a little higher than four, but not like we see in Loveland, not 35 or 24. So they still have some work to do for that plant. Um, we've been told that in order to upgrade that, the one plant that they need to, it will cost them approximately $100 million. So this is a very expensive process. Um, probably not as expensive in Loveland because we're not as big, but still an expensive proposition to get all these water systems filtering properly. So that is um, where I would like to turn it over to my husband. So I'm Tom Scovanner, Sharon's husband. She's the better half, certainly. Uh, I am a retired attorney, uh, prosecuting uh, attorney, criminal law. I don't have any, hardly any experience in environmental law. My, I had some knowledge about, I knew about forever chemicals before November, but I've <laughs> learned quite a bit since November when uh, Cincinnati.com came out with their article. Um, so hopefully, yeah, that's, that was the presentation. <clears throat> but PFOS, just to tie into what was said earlier, it was discovered in the 30s uh, by accident, like so many things are, and with chemistry and industry. And uh, industry found out that, hey, this is a really handy thing for a lot of different reasons, and we can make a lot of money off of this, and they did. Um, and that's fine. Unfortunately, we didn't realize the, the problems, if you will, of uh, PFAS until much later. And then it was a battle between profits and public health. <clears throat> well, that began to change uh, starting in 1999. There was a Cincinnati attorney by the name of Robert Ballot. He worked for Taft's Titanius and Hauser, still does. And he was contacted by a farmer from West Virginia who had hundreds of his cows dying. And lo and behold, it turned out that right next to his farm was a dumping ground for DuPont Chemical. And through the legal process, <coughs> Mr. Ballot was able to find out that the, the land was contaminated by DuPont and the cows were drinking the water from that contamination and that's why they were dying. <coughs> and as he found more things out, he was forwarding them to the US EPA say, hey, you guys need to start looking at this because it was an unregulated chemical at the time. And he came up, and if you want to really know about Mr. Balot, his book is Exposure. And uh, my wife got it here from the library here in Loveland, but then she got her own because she went through it and, and did just a little bit of additional research, the tabbing that you see on the side is what she did. <coughs> And it was made into a movie, which is also available here at the library, called Dark Water. Uh, so that's a, it's if you Netflix. want to know more about it, this is a two hours well spent. Also on it's Netflix. on Netflix. And it's on Netflix. I did yeah. hear that tonight. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> 
So the problem with one of the problems it is once the, the, these forever chemicals are bio persistent and bioaccumulative, once they get into your body, you don't get rid of them. The half life for PFOS, one chemical that we know is in our water in Loveland, its half life is 4.5 years. So if you have 10 parts per trillion in your system, in four and a half years, you're going to have five parts per trillion, still above that four parts per trillion level. And then it's going to take four and a half more years before you get to two and a half. And that's assuming you don't put any more into your body. Uh, as you put more into your body, then that throws those half-lives off again. So that's the trouble. <clears throat> uh, but through Mr. Balot's efforts, US EPA in 2016 finally came up with that health advisory level of 70 that uh, Nathan talked about, 70 parts per trillion. And as more research was conducted, the health risks associated with PFAS became more widely known and more accepted by industry and government. So in 2019, and I, I want to point out something about these, these slides. Um, I don't see the, yeah, okay. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but right there, on 20 November 2016, there's a number one. That footnote goes directly to the document in here that's number one. So this notebook is all of the research that my wife has gone through to find the documentation for this timeline. So again, if you want to look at this afterwards, you're welcome to. <coughs> So 2019, Ohio develops a plan for testing PFOS in public water systems. 1,500 water systems are tested. Um, and the Ohio EPA made some recommendations to uh, water systems. Notify your customers as soon as possible as a result of the as a result. Cities were to take steps to reduce PFOS and to publish the test results in the annual water consumer confidence report. The Consumer Confidence Report is a legally required document by the U.S. EPA. How many of you have seen the Loveland's Consumer Confidence Report? Okay. And therein lies the problem. And that's why the Ohio EPA said not only do you need to publish it there, but you need to notify your customers <coughs> about that testing. So Loveland's water was found to have some of the highest in the area um, of PFOS ranging, as we said, from 14.8 to 24 in 2020. The city of Loveland was notified of those levels, and Loveland did publish it in their consumer confidence report. But as far as we can find, through our research, they didn't send out notices to individual customers. It's in the confidence report, but again, how many here have seen that? <clears throat> and in 2020, Loveland didn't take on any steps to reduce PFAS in the water supply, as it was recommended. So we can go to the next slide, hopefully. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's yeah. Inept leading the apt. You're the apt one. I'm the inept one. Yeah. Let's see. See, that's you think that would be it. That's yeah. what I ran into earlier. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll get it. And it's two maps of the state of Ohio, and it shows the testing for this, the results of the testing in the state of Ohio. Um, that is on the Ohio EPA website. It shows that uh, the vast majority of systems in Ohio do not have PFAS in them. That's the good news. The bad news is of the 6% of those 1,500 water systems in Ohio that do have PFAS, Loveland, Indian Hill, Milford are included in that 6%. There we go. Now, on their website, and it's kind of hard to see, but it, the PFAS contamination sorry about that, is in yellow, and it's clustered in certain areas in the state, and of course, this is our area of the state. And then the map on to the right shows all of the systems, with the gray being systems that don't have PFAS detectable, and then hard to see, but there's, there's yellow there too that shows this, that the same yellow is on this map. So it shows you that it's not a wide, it is a widespread program, problem, but it's not in every water supply. It's in selected water supplies. Why? We don't know. We don't know. 
Go on to the next slide. I, I, I pressed it and we'll see how long okay. it takes. Okay, see how long it takes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in June of 2022, US EPA reduced, released health advisories for PFOS. The new health advisory for PFOS, which was down in Arwa in Loveland's water, was reduced from 70 to 0.02 parts per trillion. That's a health advisory. US EPA recommended that public water systems with PFOS in their water take steps to inform their customers. Again, the information so that people can do what they need to do as an individual. To do additional testing as to assess the level, the scope, and the source of the contamination, and to examine steps to limit exposure. Take it out of the water system, if you will. Again, Loveland published that information in their CCR. But again, we couldn't find any indication that they notified individuals, um, and we couldn't find where they'd taken any steps in 2022 to mitigate PFOS in the water supply. In August of 2022, the Ohio EPA testing found that PFOS, one of the PFOS, at 19 points parts per trillion in Loveland's water. <clears throat> the Ohio EPA again informed the city of Loveland of those results, again recommended further testing and treatment options. In March of 2023, the US EPA announced a proposed national primary drinking water regulation for PFOS with a limit of four parts per trillion, as was indicated. The proposed rule would require monitoring of PFOS, mandate public notification, and mandate PFOS reduction. In November of 2023, Cincinnati.com published an article showing Loveland's water system had some of the highest PFOS contamination in the area. Six days later, Loveland appropriated funds to study upgrading the water treatment plant so we could filter PFOS. In December, Loveland published a statement that in part said its water is, quote, safe for consumption, but provided no scientific basis for that statement. April 10th of 2024, let's be the next slide. Yeah, did it. Here we go. <laughs> the US EPA announced uh, its first enforceable national water drinking rule for PFAS. Unfortunately, in my perspective anyway, that this rule isn't enforceable until 2029. It includes a health goal of zero for PFOS and an enforceable standard of four for P parts per trillion. On April 19th, the US EPA designated PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances. That same day, Lovell published a statement again stating that it quote, produces water that remains safe for consumption, end quote, without providing a scientific basis for that statement. A month later, Loveland published the US EPA guidance for home filtration systems <clears throat> so that we, as individuals, could eliminate PFAS from our drinking water. Doesn't tell you why you should do it, but it did say that you, you could do that. And, uh, <clears throat> but the language on the city's website saying that water is safe for consumption still remains. Step five, step five. There we go. While Loveland has repeatedly stated that its water is safe for consumption, <clears throat> many experts disagree. The US EPA, the Ohio EPA, the American Cancer Society, the CDC, and the Environmental Working Group have all stated that drinking water contaminated with PFAS possesses significant health risks. <clears throat> the slide there shows their statements, and I'll give you a chance to read those. And again, <clears throat> the source for those are based upon the foot. They have the footnotes, and you can look at the source documents in this notebook. So, we've come up with a few questions in talking to people, and people have asked us some questions when we've been talking about because we've been promoting this meeting. And one of the questions is, if I drink this unfiltered glass of Loveland tap water, will I immediately become sick? And the answer is no. Certainly not. But again, it's bioaccumulative and biopersistent. So if I drink this, I'm putting PFOS into my system, then I'm probably, well, I'm not going to get rid of for at least four and a half years. And if I drink another glass tomorrow, I add more to it. So I never get rid of it. <clears throat> will drinking this glass of water add to my total PFOS exposure? Absolutely it will. Would I personally drink this unfiltered glass of Loveland's tap water? Absolutely not. Would I recommend anyone else drink this glass of Loveland's tap water? Absolutely not. 
We are personally filtering water in our home when we learned about this. Some of the systems that were talked about, we did some research and found out some systems that are better. And we've impl implemented that in our home. We also found, <clears throat> and this has been true for a number of years, but in City Hall, they drink bottled water. And we found out that some city council members have filtration systems in their home. So, would it be helpful if the city released test results as soon as they are available with putting actual numbers maybe with your water bill? That's, what the question, that's a question that people have asked us. I think so, but I, I'm not the powers that be. Should the city look into connecting to a clean water source till they can produce PFAS free water? That's a possibility. I don't know the cost. It could be very costly, but they could do that. Or at least they could tap into a source that has less PFAS than Wetlands Water does. <clears throat> There's a handout that will be available. And I don't see it. Right here? Right there. <clears throat> that talks about filtration systems and other things. I encourage you to take one of those before you leave here tonight. We are open and happy to answer any questions that you have. Sir. Got four of them. Um, what is what is the contamination density of the of the stuff that's in the of the sea pods that are in the water? <clears throat> is it per gallon, per liter? Parts per trillion. Parts, Parts per, per trillion. trillion. So Loveland has, in the most recent testing, in 2023, 14 to 35 parts per trillion. The standard that's been announced and that's going to go into effect is going to be four parts per trillion. Serious Thank you. Uh, so if we want to know how much we're consuming, we've got to, we've got to take a look at the quantities of water we're drinking. And it is uh, recommended that uh, human beings drink like, what, eight or 10, 12 ounce glasses of water a day. Uh, and has anybody broken that down into how many uh, parts per trillion of these contaminants we're consuming? Every glass of water, that's how, many, how much contamination that there is right now in Loughlin. I can't break it down any simple that. My suggestion to you, and I'm not a scientist, my suggestion to you is to get your water filter. Loveland used to submit a quarterly report to, to the people that they provided water to, and it, it listed all the contaminants that they measured. They quit doing that about two years ago. Um, is there any way we can get that restarted? You have to talk to Loveland about that. I'm sorry. You have to talk to Loveland about that. All right, so you're not interested. No, I'm interested, but I don't, I, I don't control what Loveland does. Oh, I'm you're not, not part of you're Loveland's not, government. You're not, you're not in Loveland. I, I live in Loveland. Yes, I do. But I don't control what Loveland does. Loveland does what they think is appropriate. So one of the action items on the flyer that we have is to contact the city council members and ask them questions like that, right? Yeah. Like they're, they need to know that you're concerned about your drinking water. And so that's one of the action items is to okay. you know, you. Ask, for, ask for answers. Yeah. A lot of times uh, a lot of water is commercial bottled water is actually tap water and you don't know if it's it's activated charcoal filter. So you can't really think you're safe if you're drinking bottled water like you know, Fiji water, I have no idea. And there's no requirement to list that. Um, and also distilled water, would um, do they monitor that for distilled water, which is used for baby formula? I don't know. No, the, the only way that you're gonna be safe personally is by filtering your own water, essentially at this point in time. Or if you live in the city of Cincinnati, you know that your levels are good. Um, do you want to pass the microphone around, or I can I can repeat Lauren, questions as we go. Right here in the front. I was wondering about restaurants in Loveland. Same water. That's Same water. A, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I have started to ask some of the restaurants, like coffee shops, that obviously use a lot of water, um, breweries, um, and 
when I ask one in particular, I'm not going to name names at this point, um, they weren't necessarily aware of the problem. Um, some of them did say they filtered, and some did also say that they needed to let their customers know if they did. I'm hopeful that maybe at some point all the restaurants could be talked to about this, maybe something the chamber might be interested in doing, so that we can figure out a way that they can continue to do business, but um, we can also be safe. So I think it's a challenge, I'll be honest, but we need to find out. Yeah. All right. And uh, someone's monitoring the chat on the internet as well. Awesome. Fantastic. Yes, we're here in the front. Uh, so we filter our water at home, but are these chemicals absorbed through the skin? Like what about like showering and bathing? So the That's answer not is, a whole house filter. Yes, right? they, right. they yeah, can be absorbed through the skin. The I think that the level of contamination that you're probably talking about in the shower instance is not as threatening as when you're drinking it directly, but that's a good That's what I that's what I've read too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Yep. Has Loveland said anything about have they said anything about what they're gonna do? I, I read um, a water treatment facility would be the best bet, but it could be twenty twenty nine for that. I'm thinking this is bad. I mean they they can't hear what he's saying. They look bad We'll repeat the question for the length of time that this is going on but are they now coming out saying we need a new water treatment facility so the question specifically is what has Loveland said they're going to do about it Sharon do you want to sure so like we said in November of last year they appropriated funds to do a study and the company they're using is called Birches and Naipaul and they're an engineering firm and they're going to be doing a study I've asked to, to see if that study is finished and so far I haven't heard that it is finished but what we've learned is some of the techniques to filter water are massive um, pieces of equipment mm -hmm. and if you know Loveland's water treatment plant it's tiny mm -hmm. so it won't accommodate what we need to use for filtration so if Loveland decides to continue to filter their own water and have their own water um, system which they say they want to um, a new treatment plant will probably need to be built. The people in Indian Hill have said that in order for them to upgrade their facility, it's going to cost $23 million. I don't know what's going to cost in Loveland, but they're working to find that information out. Okay. Does that answer your question? I mean, it does. It's, it's, you've answered my question. I think Loveland has got a lot of questions to answer, to answer right now. I think they are. <laughs> I think they're going to be in a lot of a lot of hot water here. Yeah. Has anybody thought lawsuit? <sighs> well, the question. I mean, you know, we've read on, in Loveland magazine and whatever about Thank people you. dying of pancreatic cancer. You know, the one lady it took. You know, it, we, we've all read about all, how she suffered and everything. Looking around the room, I don't know about you, but we've lived here 45 years. Mm -hmm. We've been. You know, you moved in in 2013. Yep. We, we've been here a lot longer than that drinking that water. And who's putting out the word that the water is safe to drink? So, you know, that is misinformation. That's a, so the, I'll, I'll repeat the, the question, which is, um, well, that was a, that was a large <laughs> statement. <laughs> Got a lot to um, but the, the question really largely revolves around is there legal action possible? Who's going to be held accountable? What's being done about it from that regulatory perspective? And so you mentioned Rob a lot and his work uh, in the legal realm, the Dark Waters movie, etc. So some years ago now, DuPont and other chemical manufacturers were held liable for some of these problems and individuals across the country are getting settlements, etc. But that is a very slow grinding process that won't affect individuals in this room unless you were part of some class action lawsuit so the real impact of the epa rules that dropped this year is it sort of sets the bar now so lawsuits for what happened prior to this year um, against the chemical manufacturers will continue to be successful i'm sure against the water providers they weren't really doing anything quote unquote illegal up until now and they have this five-year grace period under the new rules to start getting things in action that being said 
I'm sure that there are creative attorneys out there that might find their way to an uh, interesting um, solution. Uh, but what you need to be doing now is <coughs> saying, you Loveland and other communities, you know the rules, you know the timeline, you know what needs to be done, we're gonna hold your feet to the fire um, until that happens. <coughs> I'm sure that's not a satisfactory instead, instead of telling us the water is safe to drink. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you certainly a great shirt. Could I to uh, make a comment here? In July, City Council, it was brought up by the City Attorney about joining the class action lawsuit that's been referenced here, and Loveland voted, City Council voted to become part of that class action lawsuit. But that's going to take time and uh, don't know so what's going to come the out. comment is that Loveland is part of a large class action lawsuit against right. some of the chemical manufacturers. Yes. Um, really quickly, that kind of ties back to something that you mentioned earlier, which is why does Loveland have levels here in Indian Hill and Milford? I don't know the answer to that question, but you can imagine that there's probably some sort of site-specific explanation. So some source of the chemicals that is closer to your drinking water wells than it is the other ones. And if you sort of travel down the watershed, it could be that they're dissipating by the time they get to Indian Hill, quite honestly. That's mm -hmm. that's a lay, lay idea. Um, really quickly, you, sir, in the glasses. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think some of the public advocacy has already been effective. If you look at Loveland's website today, they actually have updated um, some of the information. It is a little clearer. They have a whole page now, but it's still a poll <laughs> notification, you know, I think it would be helpful for them to send something out with water bills like you had suggested potentially to let people know, you know, that aren't going to the website and looking for that. But if you do go to the website now, I think it is clear about what they're doing and where the current situation is. So that says advocacy is working, but as you said, we need to continue to hold feet to the fire to make There's sure the work is Some more information available yeah. on Loveland now, but you know, the, the suggestion tonight I think is, is a great action item to follow up on, which is get them to include the information in your water reports. That's a very simple action that can be taken and it could be potentially very powerful. Uh, yes, you, sir. By the way, uh, class of 95 in your deal? Nice. Yes, <laughs> I'm 97. Uh, Nick's ever seen because I remember you, man. Is it? <laughs> yeah, small world. Anyway, this is this. <laughs> okay, I'm a lot of mine's going tonight. Here you go, Nick. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so, um, I've been drinking bottled water since, I don't know, way over a decade because I don't trust anything you guys did. Anyway, anyhow, about bottled water. Now, does, does PFAS manifest itself as scale? Because in, in, in Loveland, there's a scale problem in the water. It's just so hard. Does that, does that, does it, is there any connection to that? I'm not aware of any like, chemical or physical connection to that problem, no. Um, that's a good question, though. Let me ask you, uh, does brush your teeth with that? Again, is, is that, I mean, unfortunately, with showers and stuff, I can't get, just because the way my, my house is designed, I can't put a filter in it without putting the filter outside the house, right? right. Which is prohibitively expensive. So, so this, is probably, this is probably not gonna be the most satisfactory answer. We know, we know several things. We know that there is no quote unquote safe level of these forever chemicals in our body. We know that they're all around us. <coughs> what, to what level can we mitigate that risk or that exposure to keep ourselves safe in the long term? Because again, these are long term issues. And number one is of course gonna be drinking water because you're putting it directly into your body, you're consuming eight glasses a day at least, et cetera. Um, there will come a time, I'm sure, when showering, uh, brushing your teeth, all these things, we can address that. But it's really a matter of, I, I wanna say low hanging fruit because it's hundreds of millions of dollars in upgrades to the infrastructure system. But right now, <laughs> worry primarily about the drinking water and what we're doing to fix that problem. Now, there was a question in the chat, and a lot of the questions in the chat I think have already been covered by the, by the folks in the room, but I'm gonna to try to address a couple of them. Um, there was a question, what, what, what other places can you find PFAS or forever chemicals in your, in your world? And the answer is, unfortunately, clothing and furniture are two very common places that these chemicals are found because they use stain, uh, stain uh, uh, resistant materials, flame retardant materials, uh, water resistant materials. So I know that there are a number of outdoor um, clothing manufacturers, uh, your Patagonias and North Faces and Columbias that have basically vowed to stop using these chemicals in their products. But even then, it will probably be some time before they can phase them out entirely. So be aware of what's around you. Try to limit your exposure. Um, but this is one of those things where, I mean, we're going to look back on a meeting like this 
in 20 or 30 years and know that we were really at the forefront of something, hopefully that we're going to be getting a good handle on. Um, I'm gonna take another question in the room and then I'll try to do from, from the chat. Nick, did you have well, a let's say, you, you started to being telling us about all the money that's available from the, from the federal government. So to talk about the cost is so disingenuous. I mean, like these are numbers, raw numbers, but they're gonna be offset, right? To, if, if the community uh, uh, you know, can apply for the money and do that, so that's why um, I understand Loveland did hire a new city employee who is well versed in these issues and so hopefully he will have the foresight to know when those application processes are happening and, and to be on top of that. I have every confidence that that will happen but that's the kind of thing that you all can help remind people of. Um, and, and what those opportunities are. Really quickly, just to get a, a question that was online, um, this is something I think we mentioned earlier, but in terms of home filtration, again, I'm gonna go outside and, and recommend going to the Environmental Working Group um, and their website. They have a list of four at-home <coughs> devices that they've tested and recommend um, that range in price, but that you can check out and they've got write-ups on each of those. So. Um, I know that's what I've, I've done. Um, yes, more questions from the room, sir? Yeah, I mean, EPA set this regulation. We have an election coming up, so another EPA administrator could change it, is that correct? That is technically true. Um, you know, for better or for worse, this was one of those scientific processes that took a really long time to happen, which means that it would take a really long time to undo for better. Um, that's not to say that someone wouldn't try. So, you know, certainly it is federal regulations like this that are of consequence in a national election. Um, you can point to a number of examples, more on the clean air front, uh, but certainly from the clean water perspective as well. Um, yeah, good question. Good to see you. Uh, yes? So you mentioned that the city of Loveland hired someone to look into this. Who is this person and what is their title? So the city of Loveland needed to replace the assistant city manager. And the person they chose to replace that previous guy with is a guy from Warren County. And he did a lot of work in Warren County on this issue. Okay. So we have had the pleasure of meeting him and talking to him. Um, we asked him to put information on the website, honestly, about filtering, and we were happy to see that that happened because we really felt strongly that people needed to know what to do at home. Um, so, yeah, I'm hopeful that that he will be of assistance. And I have to say, Dave Kennedy, our city manager, is very good at getting grants, and there will be grant money available for this. There's a lot of grant money available for it. And maybe in Ohio, because there's only Right. the yellow yeah. that need money um, maybe that will be to our advantage because I think there's about a hundred out of the 1500 that actually need to be upgraded so it's a lot like dumpy right there little spots yeah, yeah the yellow is those. where mm -hmm. a follow-up to that so obviously the city manager and now the assistant city manager that's really great stuff uh, I'm wondering if it makes sense that that we work with our our state government people, our, our local government, you know, going to the Columbus. That, that's a great point. So the question of the, the suggestion was to not only work with your local governments and water providers, but also the folks in the state house in Columbus. And, and I will say that our legislature passed um, a bill, gosh, I think it was two years ago, that actually prohibited the use of these chemicals in firefighting training exercises. So a pretty limited prohibition, but it was a step in the right direction for a legislature that often turns a blind eye to issues like this. And so that gives me some hope um, that folks in Ohio are paying attention. I know Governor DeWine um, uh, you know, announced an initiative a couple years ago where they were gonna start doing a lot more monitoring. Um, the, the interstate compact that goes along the entire Ohio River watershed from Delaware or whatever uh, down past us. They've been monitoring now for four or five years at sites along the Ohio River and the watershed. So um, the state, the federal government, local governments, it's going to take everybody. I mean, it's an international issue, quite honestly, at this point in time. Um, but uh, but yes. Thank you. Uh, just to, yes, sir, yes. Um, I, I think you said maybe you don't know what the source is, but is there any, any investigation going on with possible polluters that could be affecting the aquifer? 
Right. Question. Right. So we that's need a question. Share with oh. this, so this is the question that I would love to have answered. Right. So you're you're asking about the source, right? Because ultimately, the way we're going to fix this completely is getting rid of all the sources, right? We need chemical companies to clean up after themselves, stop using these chemicals, and every community needs to look at what they have in their community and what we might have that could be impacting others. Because this stuff moves around, right, Nathan? This That's stuff right. moves. Um, and we use the same aquifer as Loveland, Loveland Indian Hill and Milford, so we're all affected by a contaminated aquifer at this point. Um, the only thing that I can say, something that was brought to my attention in terms of Loveland, is Loveland operated a landfill. Um, from 1968, finally closed down, I think, in around 1997. Um, and there was a lot of illegal dumping there. Whether that contributes to this problem, I don't know. It does. But it does not? It's downstream from the wells. OK. Thank you. So you know, there are other possibilities. Um, Wilmington's airport has been identified as a potential source. Mm -hmm. uh, Fuel? Or I, I, we don't I know. think it's more of the, the firefighting yeah, probably yeah, right. from, it's from the, training and that kind of yeah. thing. Uh, just looking at the map, the, the cluster here tells me Wright Patterson Air Force Base is probably a contributor. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't think that's a contributor for us, but so that's where you got to look at these kind of things. So yeah, ultimately, yeah, that's what we need to find out is where the sources are and clean up the sources. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to comment? Yeah. Come down and rain? Uh, mm -hmm. Not not as much. I mean, in the water cycle, it's probably going <clears> to <throat> largely settle out. But but one thing that, unfortunately, so you mentioned bioaccumulation. So that's the concept where little things build up over time, right? So you might ingest a little bit of PFAS today, and a little bit tomorrow, and a little bit the next day. Um, treated sewage sludge yeah. is a thing these days, right? The waste management companies will take sewage sludge treat it and then use it as fertilizer and other applications but what that does in the context of forever chemicals is it just sort of concentrates them and so you get it in the sewage sludge then you reuse that and then that gets concentrated further and so it just kind of gets more and more and more bioaccumulative um, and so uh, yeah land landfills uh, sewage sludge applications and then large industrial Facilities are going to be your sort of smoking guns, if you will, uh, but it, but it's everywhere. Um, so uh, yeah, can I just make a, so back to the landfill? And correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it doesn't matter where it's located downstream because it's underwater. Like it's not the river, right? It's an aquifer. So if the landfill is here, the Miami River is flowing this way and the aquifer is up here, the flow of the river doesn't matter as far as between a landfill and an aquifer. So the question is how, how do underground currents work, <laughs> essentially. No, but, right, so we're not going to answer that question obviously yeah. tonight. I'm but just saying that you shouldn't the, rule out a landfill. No, you can't really rule out anything in this context, um, nor do we want to indict anybody particularly, but that's why we need more study. And if there is something that can be done beyond the filtration, which we need to do, but if we can stop it, like you say, at the source, if we know there is a landfill leaching somewhere, if we know that there's some factory that's dumping you know, their leachate, uh, then we can stop things like that, hopefully, from happening. Yeah, did you have another question or comment? Yeah, uh, after I talked to Sharon about this last week, was doing some reading and was talking to a friend about it this weekend, and um, he lives I live in the city of Loveland, but he lives out in Miami Township, Miami Trails area. City of Loveland does not provide their water. Do we know who does provide their water, and do we know what levels are there? Thinking of other residents in the you know larger Probably Loveland Claremont County, County, and yeah. they don't report these levels. So yeah, right. The question was, where does my Miami Township get their water? Claremont County is the likely answer. I don't know, but um, but as as Tom just said, not everybody has been testing or monitoring for this, and so. <clears throat> this does not this map does not necessarily suggest that all the other areas are free of PFAS it's just this is where we found it they haven't reported that's why they right uh, and so that's why I say I mean the the positive takeaway from tonight is that there are 50 people 
in a room learning and talking and thinking about this, and you are going to be ahead of the 500 other communities on the map. And that's unfortunate for them, but it's good for you. So what pat yourselves on the back for being here. What percentage of filter? What percentage of those are filtering their water right now? Uh, not those grains. Not like wh how many municipalities are filtering their water? Like, what well, those grain for, for forever chemicals? It's probably a handful. Quite honestly. Wow. Yes. Did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, my niece is currently in New Richmond, and they were looking at moving up to Milford, Loveland, for um, her job. And I was telling her about this situation that they should kind of check before they purchase anything. What will this do to real estate values in Loveland? Good question. So the question is, what will forever chemicals and the knowledge of them do to property values in Loveland and elsewhere? <laughs> I'm going to say something that will be both cynical and positive at the same time. Probably nothing because it will be 30 years before any realtor is thinking about that. Um, this is a very tangential example, but I'm gonna use it nonetheless. I used to live out in Santa Barbara, California, and uh, an artist wanted to do a public art installation and paint a blue line on the street where uh, sea levels were expected to rise in 100 years. It was supposed to demonstrate sea level rise. And the Realtors Association fought back tooth and nail because they said, we don't want you putting that line into the public sphere. It was the floodplain line on every single map that every homeowner would want to look at to know if their property was going to, that's all it was. So the information was already there. They just didn't want people drawing their attention to it. So long story short, I don't think it's probably going to do much for property values one way or the other because we're going to find out more and more communities are affected by this. You mentioned New Richmond. Mm -hmm. They've got problems with the coal ash ponds at Beckjord leaking. Wow. If, if, if it's not one thing, it's the other. And, that might be um, of, and there's probably some that. connections there as well. Uh, I would say if you're buying a new home somewhere, certainly think about this, but it's more along the lines of does the house have a filter? If not, how much does it cost to install exactly. <laughs> at this point? Yes, sir. If you call a forever chemical and you're saying four and a half years, half of it's gone. Is it passing through us or are we metabolizing it? Well, and eventually you, it does pass through you, but until it does, it stays that. within your blood. It stays. Well, we're not changing it or no, no. we're not reacting with it. No. Is it oil or, or water something? Is it in your liver? Is it in your blood? In your urine? It's so in your blood, right? It's in the blood, I believe. So it's fat soluble. Like it's a problem. So it's fat soluble. I am not a doctor. I'm an attorney, which means I was a fan. <laughs> <laughs> you might know more about that than we do up here, but it is something that does affect your bloodstream, and it does take a long time to get out. So, yes, sir. So your research can there. Yes. <laughs> this is more of a comment than a question. Uh, thank you for your time, and this is a lot of research here. Obviously, you're very motivated. Very thorough. Thank you very much. You know why. Question. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, do you guys know anything about the reliability of the testing for these? And are all the water plants using the same kind of test? Um, yeah. Is it something you can test for? Yeah, I'll sure. speak to it, and then you can comment too, because yeah. you may know some things that I don't. What I've learned through the testing that was done in 2020. That was um, Ohio EPA, and they did all the testing in labs that they could rely upon. Yeah. So it wasn't done by individual public water systems. Okay. So it was only a few places where they were testing. Um, so I feel pretty good about the testing that was done in Ohio at that time, and all the testing that Loveland has done was through Ohio, so not done in the city. They didn't do it themselves. So, is that what you know to be true? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think the testing regimes are, are pretty, pretty well standardized at this point in time. One of the wrinkles, though, of course, and we're talking about the, the federal regulations, which cover six of these chemicals or chemical families, and there are hundreds of them that exist. So, we're going to be learning more in regulating more and being more cons I mean, right, this is gonna be a problem that will get bigger before it gets smaller. 
Um, Nick, do you have another? Do our gardens have to drink bottled water now too? One more time. Do our gardens need bottled water now too? No. <laughs> so bottled water, I'm gonna go ahead and say bottled water is probably not a solution here because as someone mentioned before, bottled water is probably coming from a tap somewhere else that has PFAS in it in the first place. Um, I do a lot of work with the Sierra Club on plastics and <laughs> trying to get people to use less plastic, so that's a whole other story. <laughs> but no bottled water, Nick. Oh, yeah. no. But the uh, garden, does the garden go? Does it need to spill the water? So this is an issue that will affect other living organisms, um, but I've not heard of any particular need to irrigate with filtered water. Yes, you. I'm curious, Sharon, in your research, if you found, uh, is there, so there, there, there are some systems that are monitoring the, the water that's coming in uh, to households and that, but what about like the water, like drainage water, like I'm thinking like Mike's car wash and all the, I mean, that thing is full all the time and that all that dirty water is constantly going back into our water supply. So are, they, are there any regulations around testing like the water that's going in on the dirty end, or is it only being tested when it comes out on the clean end? Clean. Well, as far as PFAS, that is being tested um, when they draw it up from the well. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's how they test for PFAS. Now, in terms of wastewater from a car wash, mm -hmm. I mean, that's probably a whole another different issue. Um, I don't know that they test any wastewater do you, Nathan? So, uh, I'm, my eyes are gonna roll back in my head here for a second. It all depends on the federal law that the regulation is enacted under. And so, what we're talking about here primarily is the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is just what it sounds like. It's really about drinking water and drinking water supplies. The Clean Water Act, different law, regulates how people discharge or release chemicals or other contaminants into the environment. And at the moment, PFAS is not being regulated under the Clean Water Act. I did mention the Comprehensive Environmental Recovery and blah, 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 the CERCLA Act, which is the Superfund, that's about sort of manufacturer's responsibility. So that will get to some of the sources that you're talking about. At the moment though, there is a gap or a hole in, I'm not manufacturing the chemical, I'm not providing it to you in drinking water, but I am propagating it in the environment. That is that is a regulatory black hole at the moment. That's something that we still need to work on. Um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any new questions online. I apologize if we didn't reach anybody that asked a question online, but we can always follow up. And we've got at least one more here in the room. Yeah? Um, I understand how you're exposed to drinking water. You said it's also in clothing and furniture. If I fall asleep on my couch and breathe in that all night? Am I exposed? Can you breathe in? Uh, so it's more your skin contact. Um, now, again, I, I, I will try not to get too far into the weeds, but we've been concerned for a long time about uh, volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, that come off. Basically, they're linked to the same sort of fabric treatments, right? And so um, a long time I've heard, you know, when, I, when we had kids, like, don't let your kid on the Scotch guard carpet, right? Because you don't want to rub it off on that. Same, same kind of thing. So the exposure pathway is pretty much the same. The, the risk factor is, is very similar. Um, and, and really the origin of the problem is very similar too. Uh, so buying furniture that's not manufactured in this way, buying clothing that's not manufactured in this way, that's going to be your best bet to avoid the skin contact. One thing that was on one of my slides, but I don't know if it ever got up there, um, is uh, synthetic uh, turf. So what used to be AstroTurf, I don't know if that exists anymore, but synthetic playing fields made out of plastic uh, have been found to be a very significant source of contamination for PFAS, both into the environment as water runs off of them and into people's bodies as they're playing on them, et cetera. So Madeira just, just installed a bunch of new turf fields and I have to wonder in 2024, but. So Nathan, can I just take one yes. second? So for those people who are gonna grab a, a, a handout as you leave, um, we've listed some websites here. It's really difficult to list websites on printout, like you can't click on the link. So, you know, please just know that if you type that in, you will get to <clears throat> that website. Like you might have to make a couple of extra clicks 
But these are just some things that, you know, we couldn't get into everything tonight, but if you want further information, like one of them is the seven questions you should ask your elected officials about PFAS. One of them explains in more detail about the new regulations. One of them is about water filter, you know, how to filter your water. Um, one is about the PFAS testing in Ohio. I mean, so you can go on and research yourself and dig a little bit deeper into all of these things. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to let you know that these are websites down here for you to, like, you know, figure out, you know, on your own. Can we get a digital copy of that? We can. So, and for anybody who has signed in, what we'll do after this, I think we've decided we will send this out and send your slides, right? If you like. Yeah, I mean, and, and also, just if we have any other future whatever, if your if your email is on here and we can read it, sometimes they're illegible, then you will get this um, and the slides. So awesome. So we'll hand out the handouts. We'll make them available online and people can yeah, request them if they want. Did you have a question here in the front? So uh, for those people, especially the long term uh, leveling residents, can they directly uh, also apply to the class action suit? So that's a good question. The question is, can long-term Loveland residents or others join the class action suit that was referenced earlier? And so just to circle back to that, Loveland has joined a class action lawsuit along with other water suppliers, et cetera, um, against some of the manufacturers of these chemicals. I don't know if individuals are part of that class action or if it's primarily water utilities, but I can look at that. That's an interesting question I feel like I should know the answer to. But you're... Yes, ma'am. Make me feel better. Okay. Does my filter on my refrigerator help any at all? <laughs> Good question. I don't want to make you. I'm just going to say something. Uh, no, unfortunately for this, it probably does not. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just giving a lot of great news you bring. What about the small <laughs> So the question was, what about the small, small Brita filters? There are specific types of reverse osmosis and charcoal filters that are needed, and you're probably, you probably don't have it in your house unless you specifically bought it. But you can now, and they're becoming more prevalent. You just want to make sure you do your research that they've been tested, and that's where the I'll plug it again. The Environmental Working Group has done some testing, and they've got four. They, they there. include Brita in their stuff, but it, it's a specific. It does. Brita model, does. I think provide some, but it's not as good as the other. Right. Yeah. yeah. These these are certifications that you would look for, because these certifications are known to filter for PFAS. I'll set this up here. And this is on the handout, so you don't need to remember this. It's on the handout. So. Yes. Uh, about Brita filters, uh -huh. um, I looked it up because I was using Brita filters, and I found out that most of them do not have it. Right. So and most Brita filters are yeah. not equipped with yeah. that. You have and to make so sure. Yeah. Buy a special one, but I yeah. figured out which one. I'd say that chances are, if and you've not bought a specific PFAS filter, you don't have one. But you'll. Yes. Also, it only filters out certain PFAS, and not all. Well, and that's, that's so the statement was that these filters only filter out certain forms of these chemicals and not all of them, and that is true. And like I said, this is going to be a conversation that will grow and evolve over time, and probably the filters we were using in 10 years are going to be better than the filters that are available today, I hope. Um, we've got about five more minutes. If anyone else has any questions or comments, but thank you very much for spending your evening. Um, Obviously, the tenor of the conversation was about the scary thing that's happening to us all and why you should be concerned. But I do want to make us happy and positive because, again, you're here, which means that you're ahead of the curve. It's a long-term problem. And if you get started on the solution today, that means that you hopefully will you know, hold off for that long-term problem. But it means you need to be personally vigilant and it means you need to talk to your elected officials and the people in charge of your water supply to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, but if we do it together, I think, uh, I think that it'll work. And again, signs are pointing to the fact that Loveland 
whatever they've done in the past uh, is maybe turning a corner on this issue um, and you can all help to ensure that that happens. But thank you all again. Thank you to Loveland Magazine. Yeah. All right. All right. Anybody want some water? <laughs> Thank you.